So, there's no denying the importance and the impact of the original 2000 X-Men movie. As one of Hollywood's first serious attempts at a big-budget superhero film, its success proved that audience were definitely thirsty to see these types of stories brought to life in live-action form, and it of course kick-started a long-running X-Men movie franchise and encouraged studios to start buying up every popular comic IP that they could get their hands on. But while X-Men remains a solidly enjoyable superhero movie today, it's it's also fair to say that not everything about it has aged all that well. In fact, I'd go as far to say that there are some things about the 2000s X-Men movie that we've all hated ever since the film first came out, whether we wanted to admit it or not. And that's what we're here to talk about today. As I'm Jules, this is WhatCulture.com, and this is everything you always hated in X-Men. Number 15. The Absence of the Animated X-Men Theme Now this film left some fans disappointed right from the get-go, as X-Men's brief CGI-laced opening title sequence didn't feature the expected reprise of Ron Wasserman's iconic, even legendary theme from the 1990s X-Men animated series. Not even a hint of that unforgettable theme is found in Michael Kamen's original score, which while certainly being good, feels a little lacking without even the faintest invocation of the single piece of music that everybody associates with X-Men. In fact, it wasn't until the recent Doctor Strange in the Multiverse of Madness that we got to hear an orchestral version of the theme in a Marvel movie, where Professor X showed up in the film's infamous Illuminati sequence. Number 14. Rogue's Terrible Southern Accent Look, nobody wants to bag on a young actress trying to make it in Hollywood, but in the case of Anna Paquin, she already had an Oscar to her name for her performance in The Piano many years earlier, and so it doesn't seem unfair to expect better from her where her southern accent for Rogue is concerned, which, to be blunt, is atrocious. From the moment that we hear Rogue speak, it sounds like a highly affected attempt at a southern twang, but the worst part is that it's wildly inconsistent throughout the film, ramping up and then fading away between scenes. The decision was evidently made to phase Rogue's accent out for the sequels, yet ironically when she later starred in the HBO vampire series True Blood, her southern accent was considerably more convincing. She definitely put in the work it seems. Number 13. Wolverine Can't Smell Rogue It's easy to forget that Wolverine has an enhanced sense of smell. It's a power that's used so infrequently throughout these movies, yet he does use it twice in the original X-Men film. First, he's able to smell Sabretooth before he shows up, and then, near the end of the movie, he uses the ability to detect when Mystique poses as Storm inside the Statue of Liberty. And yet, for some reason, Logan is unable to smell Rogue when she sneaks into the trailer of his car early on in Alberta. He only knows notices her when she makes some noise, which seems like a pretty odd oversight. Is this a nitpick? Maybe, but the consistency of powers is massively important in superhero movies, even when it's an ability as benign as a super sense of smell. Number 12. The Car Crash Continuity Error Now there are nitpick continuity errors, and then there are mistakes so blinding and distractingly obvious that they deserve to be called out. Case in point, after Wolverine crashes his car into a tree when Sobertooth attacks, shows the front of the truck being totally crushed. The windshield is shattered and squashed by the impact, and yet in the next shot the truck looks in considerably better condition, with the windshield basically intact, providing enough of an opening for Wolverine to be launched through it due to not wearing a seatbelt. Obviously, in reality, the crushed front of the car would have prevented Logan from being propelled through the windshield, but the power of editing is such that popcorn gobbling audiences never noticed it. In the era of streaming and 4K video where every imperfection can be poured over ad nauseum though, well, it's a glaring mistake. Number 11. The Jubilee Tease That Went Nowhere Because the first X-Men has to introduce audiences to so many characters and ideas, it naturally leaves a number of easter eggs, references, and cameos in plain sight, hinting at the mutants that we might expect to see in the sequels. But perhaps the most infuriating of these teases is the beloved mutant Jubilee, who is briefly shown wearing her distinctive yellow attire in one of the classes that is held at the X-Mansion. Now, While at the time it was easy to be optimistic that we'd eventually get to see Jubilee have a prominent billing in the X-Men franchise, over 20 years later, it is maddening that it's never actually happened. Now, she has appeared in numerous other X films, albeit only in throwaway cameo capacities. She was in X2 and X-Men The Last Stand, and also in X-Men Apocalypse, which was basically an extended cameo. Yet Lana Condor, who played her in that film, didn't appear in Dark Phoenix due to scheduling conflicts. Hopefully when the MCU introduces the X-Men fully, they won't neglect this beloved character, who absolutely deserves to get her time to shine on the big screen. Number 10. The Cringeworthy Love Triangle 
The love triangle between Wolverine, Jean Grey and Cyclops was admittedly something from the comics that was imported into this movie, but I ask you, did it really need to be? There's enough going on in this film that the inclusion of a cringeworthy potential romance between Logan and Jean feels totally unnecessary, not to mention wildly rushed in a movie that's got so much narrative ground to cover. Why is this a priority? Throw in a ton of possessive male posturing such as Cyclops telling Logan, stay away from my girl, and it's by far the weakest, iffiest sub in the entire movie. That it apparently went through a lot of changes during shooting, as Brian Singer hadn't committed to one side of the romantic equation, isn't remotely surprising. Number 9. The Goofy Senator Kelly CGI Conversely, one of the most fascinating and well-executed subplots in the film involves Senator Kelly, the anti-mutant politician who is ironically turned into a mutant by Magneto. But this is the point at which the film's age begins to show, as the visual effects for Kelly's transformation are definitely not great, and honestly barely held muster even upon its original release. As Kelly wakes up, he realizes that he now possesses an elastic ability, which he demonstrates by pressing his head against his cell bars, whereby his head squeezes through the gap. The CGI is pretty pretty goofy looking even by early 2000s standards, and so thankfully isn't lingered upon for too long. In the sequence in which Kelly dies after his body rejects the mutation and he dissolves into liquid, well that also looks very silly, as Hollywood hadn't yet got a handle on complex fluid-based VFX that also incorporated human elements. It's hardly the movie's biggest sin, but it's certainly aged like milk regardless. Number 8. Sabretooth is a total joke one of the biggest complaints from comic book fans about the original X-Men movie is its rather meagre treatment of Sabretooth. Though stuntman-turned-actor Tyler Mayne certainly brings the imposing presence to this part, as a character, he's little more than a thin sketch. Throughout the film, he doesn't do much more than grunt, look big, and occasionally kick somebody's ass, but he's too often depicted as glorified comic relief, a klutz who just bumps into things and gets thrown around a lot. The character looks great but has no dimensionality whatsoever, and it wasn't until X-Men Origins Wolverine almost an entire decade later that we finally got, well, something more than this. Number 7. Wolverine's Silly Motorcycle Ride Now here's a scene that almost nobody talks about despite the fact that it is just so incredibly goofy. Midway through the film, Logan steals Cyclops' motorcycle in order to chase down Rogue, who has decided to leave the school. While driving the bike around, Logan notices a strange button on it, which he of course presses. This initiates the bike's boost function, sending the bike careening forward at an insane speed, all the while Logan barely holds on, and clearly he loves it. And yet, the weird digital treatment of the shots, rendering Hugh Jackman's face as a shaky blur, and the clunky movement of the bike itself make the scene feel so, so much of a product of the early 2000s. Number 6. Why didn't Xavier make Sabretooth remove Magneto's helmet? At the end of the film's second act, Magneto takes custody of Rogue, and Professor X uses his abilities to mentally possess Sabretooth, in turn grabbing Magneto by the neck in an attempt to stop him. However, Magneto uses his abilities to turn all of the surrounding police officers' guns on themselves and then threatens to fire them if Xavier doesn't let Sabretooth go. Xavier relents and in turn proves himself to be considerably more stupid than anyone expected. Because here's the question, why didn't he just have Sabretooth remove Magneto's helmet, which would have allowed Xavier to then control and subdue Magneto as well? Yes, the answer is basically because the movie says so, but it's still a glaring oversight that Xavier, of all people, would miss a wide open opportunity like this. Number 5. Storm's Wildly Inconsistent Accent Though on paper Halle Berry seemed like a fine casting choice for Storm, her performance in the first X-Men film in particular was divisively received by the fanbase, and even in the sequels where she was largely deemed a disappointment. But the single most staggering issue with Berry's portrayal is her infamously shifting accent. In the first film, she plays Storm with an apparently Kenyan accent, yet it's so wildly inconsistent and difficult to pass that you couldn't be blamed for failing to notice. For whatever reason the decision was made, probably sensibly, to more or less ditch the accent in entirely for the sequels, where she basically speaks with her own natural American accent. While you can appreciate the desire to respect Storm's Kenyan roots in the movie, Barry's inability to nail the accent ultimately proved more distracting than anything else. Number 4. The Yellow Spandex Line Comic book movies in general love their wink-wink ham-fisted fan service, and though X-Men toes the line pretty well for the most part, screenwriter David Hayter couldn't resist one toe-curlingly daft reference to the hero's iconic original attire from the comics. In the movie's third act, the X-Men don their black leather costumes to do battle as a team, a choice of wardrobe that proved massively divisive with fans who felt it deviated too much from the yellow spandex numbers from the comics. And so, as the X-Men set off to do battle with Magneto and company, there's a line where Wolverine mocks the 
black leather outfits, only for Cyclops to retort, what would you prefer, yellow spandex? Though producer Ralph Winter insists that the line wasn't intended as a jab at fans, it's nevertheless a pretty groan-worthy nod towards the mutant's iconic original attire from the comics. Later X-Men films proved to be a little less embarrassed about flashing some yellow, but it certainly took some years getting there. Number 3. Toad dances a jig because of reasons Much like Sabretooth, Toad, played by Ray Park, is a total joke character throughout the film, though at least his abilities are silly enough that it doesn't really undermine his character. Even so, it's hard not to wince at some of the goofball mugging that Toad gets up to in this action-packed third act, even going so far as for some reason decided to randomly dance a jig while battling Jean Grey. It has a strong whiff of improv that Ray Park probably just threw in there and that Brian Singer liked enough to keep in the final cut. It may only last a few seconds, but it's ultimately more of a baffling head-scratcher than genuinely amusing. Number 2. The Infamous Toad Line Surely the single moment in the movie that just about everybody hates is the infamous one-liner dropped by Storm moments before she kills Toad. As she fires up a storm, she quips to him, do you know what happens to a Toad when it's struck by lightning? The same thing that happens to everything else. The line is delivered in a dead serious flat monotone by Berry, which certainly didn't help the reception to her performance at all. Joss Whedon, who contributed the one-liner to the script, later stated in interviews that the line was supposed to be spoken with a knowing smarm rather than Berry's more straight-laced approach. It's also been rumoured that Toad was originally supposed to make a reoccurring joke throughout the film, asking about what happens to a Toad in certain situations, which would have made Storm's retort feel like more of an organic payoff. Either way, it's a terrible line reading and one that fans continue to lament over 20 years later. And number one, nobody notices Senator Kelly's yellow eyes. And finally, at the very end of the film, we see TV footage of Senator Kelly rescinding his prior position on the Mutant Registration Act, with Storm pausing the TV just as Kelly's eyes turn yellow, confirming him to be in fact Mystique in disguise. Except if Storm notices this, wouldn't members of the general public notice this as well? Now, in fairness, your average punter doesn't know who Mystique is and wouldn't immediately realise precisely what's going on, but with mutants being openly known in the world of the X-Men movies, it wouldn't take too much deductive reasoning for people to assume that the yellow eyes indicated a mutant hijacking of some kind, especially given the suddenness of Kelly reversing his stance on mutant registration. If this sort of thing happened today, in a world where everything could be clipped out and posted to social media within seconds, Mystique's ruse would have been rumbled in record time. Even back in 2000, though, it surely would have turned some heads, right? And there we go, my friends. That was everything you always hated in X-Men. I hope that you enjoyed that, and please let me know what you thought about it down in the comments section below. As always, I've been Jules. You can go follow me over on Twitter at RetroJ, but the O is a zero. Or you can swing by Instagram, where it's the same handle, RetroJ, but the O is a zero. Hope to see you over there. But before I go, I just want to say one thing. Even though we talked a lot about everything that we hated in X-Men, I want you, my friend, to learn to love yourself because you are an absolute ledge. You deserve all of the best things in life, like love love, happiness, and success. And don't let anything or anyone else tell you otherwise, alright? I want you to go out there and absolutely smash it today. I believe in you. As always, I've been Jules. You have been awesome. Never forget that. And I'll speak to you soon. Bye.